Franz von Kearney, Writings by Frank Schmidt, on the Danube Swabian people. These collected writings are republished in memory of the author, Frank Schmidt, so that others may continue to enjoy his work. May his spirit live on. In remembrance of Sissi, the enigmatic empress of Austria. Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria Empress. Elizabeth from a Winter Halter portrait. Elizabeth was the spouse of the Emperor King Franz Joseph of the now defunct dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. Her adoring subjects knew her as Sissy and her biographer called her the first modern woman. Her liberal views and aversion to protocol did not endear her to the Viennese court. Plagued by an overbearing mother-in-law ill health family tragedies and opposition to her views, she wandered aimlessly among the nobility of Europe until her assassination by an anarchist in Geneva, Switzerland, on September 10, 1890. After the 1848 revolution in Austria was crushed by the military might of the state, the imbecilic emperor Ferdinand I was forced to abdicate. Was his brother and heir, apparent Archduke Karl Franz Mann, enough to sit on the throne of the Habsburg Empire? His spouse, the outspoken and politically astute Archduchess Sophie, who lived for the day when she would become the Empress of Austria, convinced the Imperial Council that he most certainly was not. She urged her husband to forego the throne in favor of their 18-year-old son, Franz Joseph, a youth of fine appearance and great promise. When, at age 25, Franz Joseph was still a bachelor, the Archduchess played matchmaker in order to get her son a wife and eventually an heir to the throne. Choosing a bride for a reigning monarch was no simple task. The prospective candidate had to come from European royalty, from a country friendly to Austria, and she had to be a practicing Roman Catholic. For one or more of the above reasons, no one from the major royal houses of Europe qualified. Sophie then narrowed the field to a lesser nobility. In neighboring Bavaria, Duke Maximilian, head of the poor, branch of the Wittelsbach dynasty, and his wife, Duchess Ludovica, Sophie's sister, had a 19-year-old daughter, whom Sophie considered to have all the qualifications for a future empress of Austria, notwithstanding the fact that the two people in question were cousins. Knowing that Franz Joseph would be spending the month of August at the Habsburg summer residence at Bad Eichel in the Tyrolean Alps, Sophie invited Ludowika and her 19-year-old daughter Helene to spend some time at Ischl so that the young couple could get acquainted and hopefully fall in love and get married. In due time, Ludowika arrived at Ischl with two strikingly beautiful daughters in tow. To make the intent of the visit less obvious, she brought Helene's 16-year-old sister along as a decoy. When Franz Joseph was introduced to the girls, he fell head over heels in love, not with Helene, but with her vivacious 16-year-old sister Elizabeth. At a ball that night, he danced only with her. On the very next day, August 18th, which also happened to be his birthday, he asked for her hand in marriage. The engagement of Emperor Franz Joseph I of Austria and Princess Elizabeth Eugenie Amalia of Bavaria of Bavaria was formally announced in the local parish church on August 19th, only three days after Elizabeth had arrived at Ischiel. Although Archduchess Sophie's well-laid plan had gone awry, she was not unhappy with the outcome. All the reasons for which she had chosen Helene also applied to Elizabeth. Furthermore, this was one of the very few times in history that a love match between a reigning monarch and his chosen bride also coincided with the political coincided with the political considerations of the state. The engagement was a whirlwind affair, but the marriage contract was not signed until March 1854. Among other things, it set out Elizabeth's dowry, which was generous by any standard and put a financial strain on her father. Still among the aristocrats in Vienna, it was greeted with derision and a sarcastic remark. Is that all? Elizabeth arrived in Vienna via the Danube steamer a couple of days before the wedding and was received in the imperial city with such pomp and ceremony that Vienna had seen nothing like it within living memory. The jubilant crowd went wild as her carriage passed. Most people were convinced that a new era had dawned on the ancient Habsburg Empire. Their somewhat stuffy young emperor displayed the first human emotion in public when he presented his bride, the ravishing princess Elizabeth of Bavaria, to the people of Vienna. Franz Joseph had given Elizabeth a diamond-studded tiara as a wedding present. While it was being readied for the wedding, the jeweler accidentally dropped it, and when she attempted to step out of her gilded coach in front of the cathedral on the day of the wedding, the tiara got snagged in the doorframe. For those in the know, these two incidents were considered to be a very bad omen. The wedding took place at St. Stephen's Cathedral on the 20th of April, 1854. The religious ceremony conducted by Archbishop Othmar Rauscher and 70 assistants began at 7 p.m. Elizabeth was overwhelmed by so many senior aristocrats in their gaudy uniforms. The bishop's interminable speech, the pomposity of the Catholic Mass, and the exalted choral presentations. When the ceremony was finally over, she and her new husband went to the anteroom of the cathedral, where she is said to have cried her eyes out. Between sobbing spells, she told Franz Joseph that she loved him dearly and would have loved him even more if he were a simple tailor's apprentice. The pageantry, which Elizabeth thought belonged to another century, was anathema to her. Later, at another venue, she was presented to the ladies and gentlemen of the aristocracy, the same ones who had privately joked about her meager dowry and her lack of social graces. She sensed their state of mind, 
and time built up an intense dislike for them. The imperial couple attended a gala dinner just after 10 p.m. and did not get to their nuptial bed till well after midnight. Too early that morning, Ludovica and Sophie, the mothers of the bride and groom, barged into their bedroom, not too discreetly, one may presume, to ascertain whether the marriage had in fact been consummated, that the most intimate details of her personal life should now be the concern of the court, bothered Elizabeth very much, and among other things, eventually led to the virtual disintegration of her marriage. Even during their honeymoon in the Luxembourg Palace, Franz Joseph, like the good bureaucrat, he was drove to the Hofburg every day to attend to state business leaving Elizabeth at home, with her mother-in-law and the lady-in-waiting Sophie, had chosen for her whom Elizabeth considered nothing more than Elizabeth considered nothing more than a spy to keep tabs on her every move. Utterly bored, Elizabeth accompanied her husband to Vienna one day. Her lady-in-waiting noticed that she was wearing shoes she had worn before, and reported this to Sophie. Upon Elizabeth's return that evening, she was scolded by Sophie for wearing a used pair of shoes. According to her, an empress of Austria was never to wear the same shoes twice. Such trivialities bothered Elizabeth so much that the relationship between the two women became so strained that Elizabeth came to regard the archduchess as her nemesis and the palace as her prison. There is no doubt that Sophie wanted nothing but the best for her niece come daughter-in-law, whom she considered to be still too naive and immature to take on the role of empress. She took it upon herself to instruct her in the proper decorum to be observed in the palace and public gatherings. Although Elizabeth had an education commensurate to the daughters of the nobility in that age, Sophie still engaged tutors to upgrade her knowledge of the history of the Habsburg Empire and culture of its diverse peoples. Elizabeth already spoke her native German and English as a second language, but Sophie decreed that she also learn French, the diplomatic language of the period. Even before she had mastered this language, she was to learn Italian and Greek languages spoken in some of the Austrian provinces. In the summer of 1854, the young couple undertook a series of state visits to the provinces of the empire in order to acquaint themselves with the people, or at least the aristocracy, the Almighty had entrusted to them. The first of these was to Bohemia. In Prague, Elizabeth visited schools, orphanages, and poorhouses. The paper dutifully reported that the beautiful young empress smiled benevolently at all and sundry. She was still much too young to play the part of the mother of the nation, but everywhere she went, she got good press. A couple of years later, the imperial couple toured Styria and Corinthia, where they received a tumultuous welcome wherever they appeared. Their official visit to Lombardy and Venice, now part of Italy, was a public relations disaster. Not only was the regal pair shunned by the local nobility they were insulted, only one in five aristocrats invited to attend a gala performance of an opera at the prestigious La Scala in Milan showed up. The rest did not decline the invitation, but sent their servants and retainers. Franz Joseph, with all his faults, was basically a very decent person and did not deserve such treatment. His enemies reveled in the fact that the imperial couple had been publicly humiliated and Franz Joseph became the laughingstock of Europe. In Venice, which had been part of the Habsburg domain for over 400 years, people turned out in great numbers to see their beautiful new empress, but once the imperial coach had passed, they turned their backs on the parade and stood in silence. A couple of years later, both Venice and Lombardy were lost to Austria in a war and became part of the newly created kingdom of Italy. By this time, Elizabeth had begun to read newspapers and openly sided with the liberal elements in Parliament who blamed Franz Joseph's ineptitude for losing the war. That, and the fact that she privately advocated a republican form of government, made her no friends among the aristocracy, and earned her the distrust of her husband. When it became known that Elizabeth was pregnant with her first child, the simmering conflict between her and her nagging mother-in-law intensified, and with good reason. Without consulting Elizabeth Archduchess, Sophie had the nursery set up in her apartment in the palace, and even went so far as to hire a nanny to take care of the baby, because she felt that Elizabeth was not capable of taking care of her own child. The daughter was born to a royal couple on March 5, 1855. The girl was baptized Sophie, which was certain not to please the mother. In July 1856, another daughter arrived. She was named Gisela for political reasons after another Bavarian princess, who married King Stephen of Hungary in 1000. The longed-for son and heir to the throne was born in Vienna on April 21, 1858. Rudolf was named after the first Habsburg to be elected emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation in 1267. The children's upbringing was overseen by Sophie and Elizabeth never forgave her mother-in-law for the manner in which she practically took away her children right after birth. The marriage of Elizabeth and Franz Joseph was a mismatch from the beginning. He loved uniforms and ceremony and depended on the army and not the people to keep him in power. On the other hand, Elizabeth despised the aristocracy and the authoritarian regime and privately even suggested that the country would be much better off with a republican form of government. That coming from the Empress of Austria sounded very much like treason, and she was never again taken into confidence in matters of state. Her access to her own children was limited. She loathed her husband's constant preoccupation with work and especially his deference to his mother. Elizabeth was enamored with the poets Lord Byron and Hayne, and wrote creditable poetry herself. 
with no real friends in the palace and restricted access to her children. She spent her time riding her horse ever more recklessly, and took up mountain climbing, as if determined to break her neck. Ever conscious of her looks, she made beauty care, physical fitness, and her incomparable figure into a cult. For some unexplained reason, she rejected sexual contact with her husband. Oddly enough, she even provided a mistress for her husband in the person of actress Katharina Schrott. Her doctor described this as very neurotic behavior. Driven from her husband by her own actions, Elizabeth escaped into a fantasy world of her own making. At times, she was exuberant, and other times, rather silly. Using the excuse that she was ill after 1860, she spent much of her life on the wing, so to speak going on cures and flitting aimlessly around the spas of Europe. Sometimes, she was away for two years at a time. Although Franz Joseph's reign was unimaginative and politically disastrous, it should not be forgotten that at no time in history was life in Vienna more glittering and more productive of the spirit and the mind than during his reign. The abject poverty of many ordinary people, notwithstanding, one of the tutors hired to instruct Elizabeth was Count Genos Maleth. Unknown to Sophie, he stood for everything she was against. Not only had he taken part in the uprising against the Habsburgs, he also favored a more liberal constitution for an independent Hungary. He aroused her liberalistic nature, particularly as this applied to Hungary, and instilled a love of the Hungarian language in her. His inordinate influence over Elizabeth was suddenly terminated when the heavily indebted count committed suicide. The count's replacement was Ida Ferenczi, a daughter of the landed gentry in Hungary. She was only four years younger than Elizabeth, and soon became her confidant, if not her friend. Ida was a Hungarian patriot, whose formal education did not reach beyond a Hungarian horizon. She was no politician, but had plenty of politician, but had plenty of political savvy. What's more, she was acquainted with some of the leading Hungarian reformers, such as the respected Ferencdijk and the handsome Count Gyula Adrasi, whom she eventually introduced to Elizabeth. Elizabeth's sympathy for the Hungarian cause did not go unnoticed by leading politicians in Hungary, and when an opportunity presented itself to do something about achieving a compromise with the Imperial Council, Elizabeth took it. By 1865, negotiations between the Imperial Council and the Hungarian magnates had reached a stalemate and were in danger of breaking down altogether. That the talks, which eventually led to a permanent settlement with Hungary, were resumed, is mainly due to Elizabeth's intercession. The readiness of the Imperial Council and the former Hungarian rebels to come to an understanding was mutual. The Hungarians realized that in the land called Hungary, the Magyars, ethnic Hungarians, were an ethnic minority outnumbered by 10 other nationalities. 11% of the total population of that polyglot country was German. In a newspaper editorial published in April 1865, Ferencdijk proposed that a compromise was possible if Hungary had its own parliament, and the country became virtually independent united, with Austria only through the person of the king emperor. He conceded that Austria had special interests within the greater German community, and these would be recognized. The basis for a compromise was to be the pragmatic sanction, an agreement between the Hungarian nobility and Empress Maria Theresa, signed a century before, in which the Hungarian nobility assured the young empress of their undying loyalty and the integrity of the Habsburg lands. Franz Joseph took the next step by traveling to Pest to negotiate a preliminary deal with the Hungarians. A month later, a Hungarian delegation arrived in Vienna, which included the vice president of the Hungarian parliament count, Jula Andrassi, who was 14 years older than Elizabeth. She met him for the first time at a reception for the Hungarian delegates in the palace. Dressed in a Hungarian costume, she endeared herself to them by addressing them in their own language. She was knowledgeable and self-assured and enchantress with a keen interest in the politics of the day, who won the rapt attention of the Hungarian nobles. Perhaps better than her husband, she understood the unstable political situation in regard to Hungary and did her best to rectify it. There is no doubt that Elizabeth was largely responsible for the creation of the Austria-Hungarian monarchy. It can be considered her crowning achievement. After that was accomplished, she withdrew from the political arena. The so-called compromise, signed in 1867, created the Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy and gave Hungary virtual independence. Among other things, Hungary was given sovereignty over Banat and the military frontier region, both of which had hitherto been administered from Vienna since their liberation from Turkish rule by German troops under Prince Eugene of Savoy. Without consulting the ten other ethnic groups, Franz Joseph arbitrarily gave up the language rights of the Germans and other non-Magyars. In Hungary, which his predecessor Emperor Karl IV had guaranteed them in perpetuity a couple of centuries before, the other nationalities, more than 52% of the population, were now told that since they lived in Hungary and were now eating Hungarian bread, they should speak Hungarian. By 1905, non-1905 non-Magyar languages could no longer be taught in elementary schools throughout Hungary. In order to get a job with the government, the railways as an educator, etc., or to represent Hungary in the Olympic Games, one had to adopt a Hungarian name. To the German elements in Vienna and Hungary, the compromise was a very bad deal. Franz Joseph had caved in to a bunch of rebellious Hungarians who'd been nothing but trouble in the past. He had given everything away without getting anything in return except his title of King of Hungary, which the Habsburgs had possessed in any case for over 400 years. 
The Hungarians, of course, welcomed the compromise because they were now masters in what they considered to be their own country. The formal coronation of Franz Joseph as King of Hungary and Elizabeth as Queen took place on June 8, 1867, at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Buda. Count Andersi starred as paladin and ceremoniously placed the ancient holy crown of St. Stephen on Franz Joseph's head and declared him King of Hungary. He also touched the crown on Elizabeth's shoulder, confirming her as Queen of Hungary. Franz Liszt, the Danube Swabian composer, had composed a special mass for the occasion. The pageantry of the coronation was reminiscent of the Middle Ages. Although Elizabeth detested such ceremonies in Austria, she did not object to them on this occasion. Hungarians were enthusiastic observers of the festivities because they saw this as the emergence of self-rule. In 1860, eight ten years after Crown Prince Rudolf was born, Elizabeth gave birth to another daughter in Hungary, whom she named Marie Valerie. Gossips in Vienna, especially those opposed to the compromise, were quick to take revenge on the royal family by calling Marie Valerie the Hungarian child implying that Count Gula Andrasi was actually the father, although this proved to be a hoax. It persisted for many years until it reached the ears of 15-year-old Marie Valerie. Of all the royal children, she looked most like Franz Joseph, was the most pro-German in the family, and favored the reunion of Austria with Germany, something her mother was not interested in, even if Habsburg had been chosen as emperor. When Elizabeth did return to the palace after long absences at Christmas birthdays and other family occasions, these rare get-togethers were often painfully dull, and brought little joy to the family. At dinner, proper etiquette dictated that no one was to speak unless first addressed by the emperor. Since Franz Joseph did not possess an especially high intelligence level, the conversational stimulus was rather limited. Even Marie Valerie, who did everything to reestablish good relations with her parents, once admitted that she found her mother's visits well-nigh unbearable. On one of her healthcare excursions to Switzerland, Elizabeth left the Hotel Beau Rivage in Geneva on September 10, 1898 with her companion Countess Irma, Starma Stare, as she crossed the road and headed for the dock to take the ferry to a spa in Teredit, on the far side of Lake Geneva. As they walked briskly along the Quai de Mont Blanc, a man approached suddenly, lunged at Elizabeth, and thrust an object against her chest with such force that she fell to the ground. He tried to run away but was caught by indignant passers-by, who held him until the gendarmes arrived and took him into custody. His name was Luigi Lucini, an Italian anarchist with a long criminal record. The hotel porter who had witnessed the attack raced across the street, helped Elizabeth to her feet, and suggested both ladies accompany him to the hotel. Elizabeth did not know that she had received a fatal wound. After dusting off her dress, she told her companion that they had better hurry, so as not to miss the ferry, which was due to depart any minute. Then, in quick succession, the two women hurried to the dock and reached the boat just before it was cast off. The women went to their stateroom, where Elizabeth complained of pain in her chest and lost consciousness. With the help of some crew members, she was carried to the upper deck for some fresh air, where she momentarily regained consciousness and asked what did that young man want, and again blacked out. Countess de Ray opened her corset and was appalled to find blood oozing from Elizabeth's chest. She immediately called the captain to the scene and told him that the woman was the Empress Suiene of Austria-Hungary, that she had apparently been stabbed and needed immediate medical attention. The captain lost no time in turning the ship around and reached the dock minutes later. Elizabeth was taken 100 meters to the hotel on an improvised stretcher where she was examined by two hastily summoned doctors. They soon determined that she had been stabbed with a small object like an ice pick that went right to her heart. Because the object was so small, it took time for the heart cavity to fill up with blood. They both agreed that nothing could have been done even if they had been at the scene earlier. The doctors were amazed that Elizabeth did not know she was stabbed and almost ran to catch the boat. When it became obvious, the Empress could not survive a priest was called to give her the last rites of the Catholic Church, and at 2. 40 p.m. Elizabeth was pronounced dead. At 3. 0 p.m. Countess Sisteray sent a telegram to Franz Joseph, informing him of his wife's death. Reminded that his brother, Maximilian, the erstwhile emperor of Mexico, was executed by a revolutionary firing squad, that his sister-in-law had been driven insane by this act, that his son Rudolf shot his mistress Maria Vetsira at a hunting lodge in Merling and then committed suicide. He was utterly devastated when he learned of his wife's death and was heard to exclaim in anguish, Will nothing be spared me? Condolences poured in from all the heads of state and people from all over the world. The government and people of Hungary were especially shaken by the news, because they saw her not only as their queen, but also as their friend. Elizabeth was entombed in the Capuchin Church in Vienna, where her body rests to this very day. Unknown to Franz Joseph, at the time, he still had more crosses to bear. His mistress, Katharina Schratt, who'd been his loyal companion, finally deserted him. The heir to the throne, his nephew Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, were assassinated in Sarajevo in the summer of 1914, a dastardly act which precipitated the First World War. In the end, Franz Joseph burdened with the affairs of the state and too old and weary to have any influence. He was quite alone when in 1916 he closed his eyes forever on his iron soldier bed. In November 1918, just two years after his death,
the House of Habsburg also came to an end after 642 years of tumultuous history, as did the old order in Europe. In 1998, a century after Elizabeth's demise, we are again being reminded of Sissy, the capricious empress of Austria, the liberal-minded idol of the common people and progressive elements in her empire, who was virtually a saint to the Hungarians and unknown to most people, was the harbinger of the women's liberation movement of the 20th century. On the 100th anniversary of her tragic death, one can only speculate on what she could have achieved if she had not been constrained by convention and the shackles of the imperial court. It is now time to put the legend to rest and let history be her judge. As we commemorate the passing of 125 years since the tragic assassination of Empress Elizabeth of Austria, affectionately known as Sissy, her enigmatic personality and historical influence come to the forefront. From her unconventional marriage to Emperor Franz Joseph to her untimely death in 1898, Sissy's journey was marked by challenges and societal expectations. Her impact on the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867 and her role as a symbol of women's liberation remain significant. As we reflect on the passage of time since her death, we ponder the potential she could have realized outside the confines of tradition. Sissy's story resonates across time, echoing with the women's liberation movement of the 20th century. What aspect of Sissy's life strikes a chord with you? Share your thoughts below. If you found this exploration intriguing, remember to like, subscribe, and share not only with fellow history enthusiasts, but also with your Danube Swabian social clubs and family. Let's keep delving into the past's intricacies. Until next time, keep exploring, learning, and cherishing history's narratives. Wir sind Donauschwaben, Kinderskinder. 